Hello, it's Scott Manley here. If everything goes according to the plan today, we should see a launch of a SpaceX rocket. We should see the recovery of a booster and we might see the recovery of a fairing with Mr. Stevens, which has now moved to the East Coast to commence fairing capture uh, operations. But most importantly, the three payloads on this rocket, well, one of them is particularly interesting because it is the first privately funded spacecraft which is supposed to land on the moon. Now this is by a team called Space IL who were part of the Google Lunar X Prize which put up a large cash prize for the first team to land on the moon privately and uh, of course then translate across the surface. Space IL were the leading contenders, but even they could not make the deadline. And it's almost a year after the final closure of the competition, and we will be seeing them launch. Of course, uh, they're launching. It's going to take a couple of months for them to actually reach the moon. First of all, their lander is very, very small. It's going to be the smallest spacecraft to land on the moon in theory. Uh, it's going to go into a initial geostationary transfer orbit because the main payload is a geostationary communication satellite. There's another payload which is a, a military microsatellite that's about something like 60 kilograms. But from this geostationary transfer orbit, what they're going to do is burn the engines to lift the aphelion, or sorry, the apogee up until they're getting close to the moon and then get captured by the moon. This will take several orbits because the engine isn't hugely powerful. From there, they're going to capture into an eccentric orbit around the moon, circularize, and then they're going to attempt to land in the Sea of Serenity. This would make Israel the fourth country to land a spacecraft on the moon, uh, but it would make them the first to land a commercially funded spacecraft. Now, Israel does actually have its own launch capability in the form of the Shavit rocket, which is a three-stage solid rocket with an optional fourth liquid stage. But that has only launched 10 times. Its payload is something like 600 kilograms into low Earth orbit. And most notably, Israel usually launches its spacecraft to the west instead of the east because of neighbors that might complain. But yeah, the Falcon 9 is going to give them a much bigger boost than they could ever get from any of their own launch vehicles. And, uh, you know, even although they're a passenger one of three, they are going into an orbit that's getting them a good way out of Earth's gravity well. The booster that's being used, incidentally, was previously used for Iridium 7 and for SAO COM 1. That was the one on the west coast that we had the beautiful display. It was the first booster to land at the landing zone at Vandenberg. So uh, this will be its third flight. The lander is actually pretty tiny. It's something like 600 kilograms fully fueled, 150 kilograms when it gets to the surface. It's going to obviously use hypergolic fuels. It's got a very simple rocket motor on board. And according to the designers, it's actually the first bi-propellant rocket motor that Israel has really tested in state in space. And yeah, as you can see, I tested out a clone of the design in Kerbal Space Program. Again, realism overhaul using realistic rocket masses, realistic engine powers, distances, and indeed also dropping it neatly into the Sea of Serenity, just in case you were wondering where that was on the moon. to the uh, Slightly to the southeast of that, that is the Sea of Tranquility, where, of course, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed 50 years ago. Anyway, after landing, it will do some science, it will take some pictures, but according to the X Prize, the original plan was that the spacecraft had to then move laterally across the surface, and they thought rovers. But of course, all the teams that were smart decided to build a hopper, which would rise up and fly laterally on their rockets. As it turns out, this wasn't even a particularly original idea, because Surveyor 6 took a small hop back in the 1960s. It's been kind of interesting watching this probe develop as well. It started out much more boxy. I like this image, by the way, because the Earth is partly transparent. But after a while, they unveiled this nice, you know, 3D printed, you know, gorgeous looking piece of workmanship. And it had all this space for the sponsors' logos and everything, right? It would look great on the surface of the moon with the Earth still being slightly transparent. But eventually, the 3D printed parts gave way to much more traditional struts and spherical tanks all bolted together. And right now, it's bolted to its launch buddies inside a payload fairing on a Falcon 9, ready to go and possibly get all the way to the moon and make history. 
Meanwhile, the other Google Lunar X Prize teams are still, you know, doing things. We have Moon Express, which is trying to turn into a business on itself. NASA is interested in working with it. Team Indus may still be headed for a launch. They were one of the teams that actually decided to use a rover rather than hopping around on rocket engines. In Germany, the PT scientists, part-time scientists, still think that they are in with a chance. I believe they're now working with ESA on a potential lander contract. And uh, yeah, the Japanese Hakuto rover, again, still may have uh, some future left in it. Meanwhile, on the dark side of the moon, the Chinese Chang'e 4 spacecraft or rover has been you know, wandering around, but we haven't really had a great amount of you know, detail from this as of yet. We did get to see their little greenhouse growing stuff and then got told they had all died because it had got too cold during the lunar night. And recently we got a second-hand view of the landing site from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. These images from Arizona State University, you can see the rover uh, sitting on the right there and the main lander on the left. Uh, that was an early oblique view. A few days later we got a better satellite pass that lets us Look at the trajectory the spacecraft took on the way in, so you can see some of these craters from the video. But that little box there shows exactly where it is, and of course the resolution of these images is fantastic. We can zoom right in and see the object from above, and you can see both the rover and the main spacecraft casting a shadow on the surface of the moon. If everything works out, there's also going to be a Soyuz launch today, and we're going to see Hayabusa 2 taking its first sample from the surface of the asteroid Ryugu. Last year, it dropped a couple of landers, and the surface was looked at and analysed, and they decided to do a test in a lab with a simulation of the, of the surface, of the regolith of this asteroid, to make sure that their collection mechanism would work. Now, to knock stuff up into their collection instrument, they shoot this tiny bullet into the surface. This is uh, the projection system they're going to use. This is an identical copy to the one on the spacecraft, and it's been sitting in storage for two years. They want to make sure that it still works. So, yeah, that is a video of the test with this simulated version. They also, of course, did this in super slow motion using a 480 frames per second camera. And that, of course, reduces the speed by a factor of 16, making it easy to see the debris plume shooting upwards. Now, of course, this falls back to the surface because you're doing it in a lab with gravity. But, you know, the hope is, of course, that some of that debris makes it into the sample collection instrument, which will then get stored in a canister for return to Earth in the future. So, yeah, this is going to be covered live on YouTube, although there won't be any fancy pictures. No, there'll be some pictures, but they won't be anything like that. This is the rough timeline for how long this takes. Ryugu is a very small asteroid, so they move very, very slowly. And the location and timing has, of course, been set up to make sure the illumination is correct, the location is correct, and it's going to be covered live on YouTube and everything else later today. So yeah, best of luck to everyone doing awesome space things today. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.